Before dawn on March 28th, sun, moon, and earth align to exert their greatest pull on tides. Each year, these forces draw notorious waves from the Atlantic and send them hurtling toward the Amazon River. Departing from his ship Calypso, anchored 15 miles from the South American coast, Jacques Cousteau plans to film the birth at sea of the phenomenon Brazilians call Ororoca, the Big Roar. When an extremely high tide hits certain shallow sloping river bottoms, it rears up into a massive wave, a tidal bore that carries the incoming water upstream. The waves snap into geometric designs as they bound off the banks back into the sea. Until now, no one knew the Pororoca formed so far at sea. Here, where the Amazon pours five billion tons of silt each year, the wave takes shape by crashing against the shallows the river has built miles into the Atlantic. The curling surf rises eight feet before slamming against the banks. With a deafening roar, the frenzied waves smash at the earth. The tidal bore has actually modified a portion of the Brazilian coastline. A settler tells Cousteau he was forced to move his home from the fuming waves. The Pororoca, he says, devoured his land like a beast. The Brazilian Navy celebrates the installation of Calypso's new figurehead. Newsmen and national officials offer their best wishes before the men depart. They will leave Belém, the modern port of the Amazon's mouth, and head for the unexpected in the primitive jungle upstream. Mestre Davi, a Brazilian sculptor, checks the six-foot work he has created for Cousteau. River folk believe the figurehead they call a carranca wards off evil on the difficult voyage ahead. Before the team stretches an overwhelming world, 
an awesome task of exploration. They will sail Earth's largest river, its volume surpassing the combined flow of the next eight greatest rivers of the planet. Its width will sometimes stretch for miles, its bottom plummet as far as free divers have descended in the sea. Cousteau's plan is an ambitious one. He will not only navigate the river, but evaluate it, studying water and animals, time and again boarding his helicopter to scrutinize the relation between liquid and life in this endless water forest. A newborn river, the Amazon is strong and clean and still undamaged. It nurtures a forest twice the size of any other river basin. Half the world's bird species fly above mahogany, cedar, and cinnamon trees. A thousand tributaries interlace the jungle. Ten are themselves larger than the Mississippi. The Tapajos, where azure waters bloom with microscopic plants. The Rio Negro, whose powerful currents carve ripples in the coarse sands of the bottom. The shifting dunes are clearly visible in the depths through water cola colored by decomposing forest matter. A mighty river itself, the Negro nearly doubles the size of the Amazon when the clashing hues of their waters meet. An eternal supply of the essence of life, water cycles from tree to cloud to tributary. The river Spanish explorers call the Sweetwater Sea drains enough water to fill Lake Ontario in three hours drawn from a basin almost as large as the continental United States. The plenteous liquids are supplied by raging storms that last five minutes. Rain pours 130 days each year. Enormous quantities of Atlantic seawater are vaporized by the equatorial sun. Trade winds blow the clouds westward where they condense over jungle foliage and unloose a deluge. Pilot Bob Brombank interrupted a flight to return before the storm. Pelting rains chipped paint from the tail propellers. Though tempests here can batter the jungle with many times more rain than storms in temperate zones, scientific water sampling continues. Life goes on. On average, 80 inches of rain saturate the basin each year. The same water falls repeatedly. The heat of yesterday evaporated the rains for today, which will rise to fall again tomorrow. Rain is the Amazon's vertical river. Calypso reaches Manaus, crossroads of highways into the interior. Here the team will disperse. Cousteau discusses an itinerary with Raymond Cole, who will lead one expedition 6,000 miles through the jungle. Two essentials are emphasized. Pack snake serum and check water quality when crossing each tributary. 
Chaque fois que vous avez une rivière, que vous traversez une rivière, regardez si l'eau est claire. Où est le premier bac après le bac de Manaus The next morning, Cousteau and Cole note the rivers that must be traversed by ferry. Besides its six-wheel drive truck, the team takes an experimental amphibious vehicle propelled by hydrojets in water. Even as he says goodbye, Cousteau anticipates exciting results for the three-part plan he has conceived. Cole's land team will first head south toward the Madeira River, being dredged for gold. Calypso will sail as far inland as possible, gathering continuous data on water and animals along the Amazon itself. Mission headquarters. The ship is outfitted with a satellite hookup, which Cousteau will use to contact inland teams. A third expedition will start from the Amazon's source in the Andes. Led by Cousteau's son, Jean-Michel, they will then follow the headwaters, meeting poachers and crossing Indian territory, to join Calypso at Iquitos. Together, the three teams will complete a baseline study of the Amazon's full 4,000-mile course. The quest for the source begins in the Peruvian Andes. Before starting their two-day climb, Jean-Michel's team sets up camp on a mountain terrace 2,000 feet higher than Mont Blanc, the highest peak of the Alps in Europe. By morning, their tents will have frozen solid. Among the craggy caves where Incas believe their forefathers emerged, the thin air nears polar temperatures. The team is unaccustomed to the bitter cold at high altitudes, yet the morale of the men is high. Their goal, the summit of Mount Mismi, the Amazon's farthest source. Some experts say the Andes, formed when geological plates collided, once trapped South American waters in an inland sea. As the eastern coast eroded, the sea eventually flowed toward the Atlantic, forming the Amazon. The Andes still buckle and break. Loose boulders rolling out under the men's weight make the path treacherous. Jean-Michel, given his traditional hat by a Peruvian llama herder, knows the ascent will be excruciating for men who are sailors, not mountaineers. Our 20-pound backpacks are crushing. We walk 10 minutes, then rest 5, perspiring, gasping up the oxygen-thin air. After camping at the snow line, the team begins its second day in altitudes more than a mile above those considered hazardous to human health. None of the men suffer soroche, dizziness and headache that signal mountain sickness and can be fatal. But there are other difficulties, melting ice, brutal differences between freezing shadow and broiling sun. Our faces, even our nostrils, burn dry in the arid cold. Breathing rapidly, we exhale tremendous amounts of water vapor. There is nothing to drink, we chew ice. The men have slept little. Their food is too frozen to eat, but no one wants to quit. At last, the summit appears within reach. 
the third expedition to climb Mizmi in modern times, the men know that Incas somehow tread here in ancient eras. Recent explorers found a golden statue at the crest, left by Indians who may have sensed the mountain's significance for life below. The men strap on spikes, steps quicken and spirits soar. Perhaps it is the altitude or fatigue, but as we near the summit, I'm overwhelmed by nature's grandiose plan. High on the continental divide, trade winds, rain clouds, even the Earth's crust have come together through geological time to create the greatest river in the world. The men wave the Cousteau banner and their own flags. Then make one last symbolic gesture. The snow we throw to the west will melt into the nearby Pacific. The snow tossed east will flow across the continent. A few icy drops that eventually will feed a torrid jungle river seething with life. Thousands of miles inland, the jungle has absorbed the liquid it needs. Water seeps from leaves and returns to the sky in vapors that rise in the advent of dawn. By June, the rains have ended and the Amazon has overflowed. Its silver stain spreads over the vast jungle, immersing trees in deep water. As we near the flooded forest, I am filled with an eerie sense of anticipation. Do even the renowned tales about the Amazon really describe this realm, where seasons are marked not by changing leaves, but by the rise and fall of water, where land animals learn to swim, and fish are said to perch in forest branches, where reality, if all this is true, must come close to dream. Time has turned back. I feel curiously out of place riding in a zodiac, wearing a wristwatch inside this prehistoric world. The Amazon forest is geologically a new creation. Peace, warmth, and water have conceived a domain more rich than the sea, more intricate and fragile. Once our entire globe was as abundant with life as this one virgin expanse.
I am aware of my abysmal ignorance as a modern man of the infinite connections between water, plants and animals that make this jungle possible. The forest and river reflect each other's needs precisely, each giving of its own fertility to support life above and below the flood. Insects range from sinewy boughs above us. They provide food for fish. The land animals that eat this fish will in turn fertilize the forest. The pink dolphin surfaces to breathe, wagging its unicorn snout. I have seen thousands of dolphins at sea, but this unearthly mammal soars among the treetops. The bizarre creature seems to have escaped evolution, fleeing to the forest, hiding from time. Messenger of Peruvian gods, the condor soars above peaks two miles high. Rio Apurimac, the Amazon's headwaters, tumbles from these heights, cutting a canyon with rapids so turbulent no one has emerged from it alive. These waters, clawing at the Andes, give the Amazon its mineral riches. You see these glaciers, they descend jusque dans l'Apurimac. Jean Michel and his expedition leader, Dominique Soumian, plan to follow the Apurimac from its meltwaters. They plan to travel as far as the canyon. Ahead lie rapids internationally rated as dangerous. So what do you think? Well, we could probably come through here. On, on uh, the, the left side? Right? Yeah, on the like left this. side. What no. happens if we go on the right side? Now, if we go too much to the right, now the problem would be if we bounce against the rod and go too much to the right, the right will be trapped between those rocks. And what do we now, do? Now, that would be bad. Huh? We have to get out? Uh, we'll see what happens there. I don't know once we get there. The tributary is riddled with stretches like these, whirlpools, hidden rocks. The men are ready. <laughs> Yahoo! The first spine-jarring bumps throw Dominique out. Come in, Dominique! On the impact of the rocks, he loses his grip on the raft. Dominique is safe. Underwater 20 seconds, he judged it as a full minute. It seemed an eternity. Twice, he says, he surfaced, but came up under the raft. He had to hold just one breath of thin, high-altitude air. The men have reached their destination. Ahead lies the deadly canyon. Nearby, a thermal spring bubbles from deep within the mountain's volcanic interior. Weary from effort and expended adrenaline, 
the team sinks into the warmth of the waters and their own success. Meanwhile, the Apurimac rages on, tearing more minerals from the canyon and delivering them on the other side into the Amazon. Heavy with the mineral plunder, the Amazon hoards its riches when it meets the Rio Negro. The largest river and its largest tributary converge, but do not mix. In the Amazon, there are two different Cousteau types. confers with scientist Phil the Dustin. The Amazon is the color of creamed coffee. But as we came up here, we were going through patches of brown water and then black water, and brown water and black water. So the river does not mix evenly until down at this point here, some 60 miles down. These are two vast inland seas coming together and mixing at tremendous volumes of water. The turbid Amazon brims with nutrients, but is bereft of sun, thus low in plankton for fish to eat. The Rio Negro is more transparent, but nutrient poor and highly acidic from decaying foliage. Cousteau sends divers to study the cloudy stains. At the walls where these waters meet, acids are diluted. Sun awakens the seeds of life. Algae bloom. Fish from both rivers feast together. The junction provides a symbol of the Amazon. Nature combines elements and life explodes. Many of the Amazon's fish species, more numerous than those in the Atlantic, are undiscovered or dimly understood. Bioacoustician Dr. René Busnell joins the expedition. In lagoons where even a fish in hand may have no name, the unseen acoustical world is bewildering. Calypso sound engineer Yves Zlotnicka records fish. Their bassoon-like grunt seems similar both in and out of the water. The sounds of the river remind me of a jungle dawn. Innumerable species make innumerable noises, compensating for low visibility in murky water. The unidentifiable groans do not satisfy our curiosity. They tantalize it. The mysteries of aquatic life have no end they may have an apex. Little is known about fish migrations, but one fact is undeniable. They are spectacular. Aroused by the rise and fall of floods, schools race through the river. They may speed toward food supplies or spawning grounds. Whatever the quest, millions join. A movable feast one migration is known as Piracima, the ascent. When floods begin to drop, fish swarm from jungle tributaries and press upstream in the Amazon to breed. When the rains begin, they will retrace their long journeys to the forest and the new flood. Leaping fish can be a sign that predators follow. The fish jump from the jaws of one carnivore into the nets of another. Protein malnutrition is non-existent 
even among the poorest inhabitants living along this river. One species feeds another. The lushness of the Amazon jungle presents a riddle. Individually, soil and water each is inadequate to support such bounty. How does apparent scarcity create abundance? Cousteau and his divers will seek the answer below the waters of the flooded forest. We have sailed a river whose cloudy, sunless waters grow little plant food. We have sampled tributaries so acidic that peasants call them rivers of hunger. The forest floor erodes. Yet around us, life thrives. The flood offers the answer to this riddle. Below its waters, all the elements of the Amazon join. The animals, fish, and foliage. Even the Andes combine to create luxuriance. The water is less murky than any we've filmed in the Amazon. As the flood advances, plants filter out mud. Near motionless waters decant. Sediments settle. Trees flourish on minerals swept from mountains. Other plants send roots upward, drawing on humid air, an evolutionary adaptation to submersion for several months each year. The forest is amphibious. The sunken world seems bottomless. Divers descend about 12 meters, four stories, to reach the floor. Every piece fits a living puzzle. The waters are shadowed by jungle. Photosynthesis that cannot occur below occurs above as trees towering over the flood drop their produce. Fish feed on the harvest, storing fat for the dry season. Sediments absorb the acids of decaying vines. The waters, chemically neutral and filled with plant food, will flow back to enrich the river when the flood recedes. The river feeds the forest. The forest feeds the river. In abundance, fish are selective, waiting beneath trees that bear sweet, fleshy fruits. They swallow some pits whole, sowing the seeds, renewing the forest. Leaves sustain them when their favorite fruits are gone. The telltale sigh. A pink dolphin never filmed underwater in the wild. The animal seems an illusion, twisting with magical flexibility. In this element, its oddity becomes rational. Gliding effortlessly among trees, the creature confirms the words of a naturalist who once pondered the unity between water and wooded earth. In Amazonia, he wrote, there exists nothing dead and nothing alive which does not attest for it. Dusk falls. Fish retreat to the flooded forest to hide from nocturnal predators.
On cloudy, moonless nights, aquatic creatures are most calm. Fisherman Aldeberto Moreira ties a flashlight to his hat and knowingly paddles into the jungle. Skillfully aiming his trident, compensating for refraction, he skewers his prey. Aldeberto talks with the Cousteau land team. Each year, he claims, he catches 10 tons of fish with his trident, another five with hook and line. He names the species. <laughs> the famous piranha, 28 teeth and muscle jaw, efficient as a meat cleaver. Cole directs the amphibious truck into the forest. By day, the men will dive where Aldeberto catches piranhas by night. Nature's grand excesses in the Amazon, the largest, best, most unmatched, have given rise to towering legends, all the more intriguing in a jungle so unknown. The men hope to separate reality from fantasy in stories about the notorious carnivore fish. Xavier Desmier and Louis Poiselin take advantage of their dive to check the truck. The vehicle accommodates nine people and reaches speeds of seven miles an hour in water. The two divers are ready to stalk their quarry. Myths of piranhas are known worldwide. Even serious texts speak of an entire army devoured while fording a river, of piranhas that attacked one man and left his skeleton neatly clothed. Sober facts are fewer. Of 20 known species, five eat meat. Swimming in placid, shallow waters, piranhas are most aggressive when water is low and food is scarce. The caiman also lurks along quiet riversides. The reptile eats mammals, waterfowl, and only occasionally humans. Second to the anaconda as the largest snake of the Americas, the longest boa found measured 18 feet. The serpents uncoil their prey, then squeeze to the point of suffocation. They pose dangers to humans only when they grow to unmanageable lengths then seize an opportunity to cast their coils around the handler's arms as well as neck. The largest rodent, the capybara, has no den. When threatened, the animal submerges in water. There, it is bitten by piranhas, if already wounded. Piranha, the creature early naturalists call the scourge of the Amazon. The fish has teeth so sharp that natives use its jaws as scissors. 
Ranchers complain they ravage livestock herds. They seize a piece of chicken in a feeding frenzy. Their three-edged teeth, specialized for different foods, clack like castanets. Within the swarm, jaws clamp, shearing out chunks of flesh the size of olives, piece after piece. When one of these carnivorous fish bites a bird or rodent, hundreds more piranhas arrive, and a melee is ignited as soon as the water smells of blood. Yet Xavier is not attacked. Settlers also let their children swim in waters where piranhas throng. Who can say why? A final inexplicable. While piranhas didn't bite the human hand that fed them, they bit the hand that filmed them. President bleeds. No horror devours him. Fishing for piranhas, Aldoberto bats the water, not because, as myth would have it, fearless piranhas seek out havoc, but because the little fish know that splashes may mean food. <laughs> The scourge of the jungle. The piranha is much like the Amazon itself, world-renowned, but very little understood. The Amazon's flood nurtures a jungle throbbing with life. But all who try to share her bounty find themselves captive to her relentless rise and fall. Neither man nor animal can claim permanent territory, as receding floods undercut the banks and forest slips into the river. In the thick, rich sediments left by retreating waters, farmers plant and harvest rice and maize between rain seasons. Their crops will be devastated if the flood returns early. Yet they continue to sow seeds as settlers here have for centuries. Nomadic men whose impermanence reflects the rhythms of the river. The dry months, a season of scarcity for water life, now banished from the forest, is the Amex come, the Indians say, the good time for man. Settlers hasten through muds to catch game, to set nets in shrinking ponds where fish concentrate. <laughs> the flood has left its mark, tons of silt. Cousteau sends his men to walk a jungle they once explored with aqualungs. Flora and fauna adapt to the ever-changing environment. Seeds germinate quickly. Some fish hibernate in muds until they can again glide among trees where divers once swam. Above the water's ebb and flow, monkeys thrive by staying in treetops. The pulse of life beats with the pulse of the flood. As the Amazon proverb affirms, man and the river are always going. Only the forest remains.
Settlers say this bewildering world is haunted, that monsters steal the shadows of greedy hunters, that dolphins bewitch those who harm them. But there are other ways to explain the Amazon's assortment of life. You know what fascinates me is what you said the other day. In a way, the Amazon forest could be considered as an upside down coral reef. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I think that's a great idea. And uh, actually, the richness of the water in a coral reef is found under the surface. And here, it's found above the surface. Like the coral kingdoms that grow in near sterile ocean waters, the variety of life in the Amazon, in fact, sustains itself. Exotic species multiply because of their interplay. Birds, butterflies, flowers and trees, like the colorful creatures of sunken reefs, share their resources, claim territories, hierarchies, rivalries, amorous alliances. The coral reef and flooded forest are only different stages. Costumes change, but the same endless opera plays on. A giant river otter, rare on earth and little known, has joined us in our expedition. Nicknaming the creature Cacha, short for Cachaça, a Brazilian endearment, we found the animal ailing in an abandoned zoo. Determined to nurse him, we brought him to Calypso and built a pool on board. At first snarling and suspicious, the animal has become a special crew member. Catcher grabs fish like hot dogs in his agile paws. Humming is one of the many sounds these intelligent animals use to communicate. Their noisiness usually attracts a bullet. Here the calls bring friends. Two species reveal needs. One to give affection, the other to receive it. The Amazon's headwaters splash into a braid of streams when they escape the Andes. Descending from the river's source, the Cousteau team detours the last lethal mountain rapids to join the headwaters at their entry into jungle near Louisiana, Peru. Christened by the wife of a local landholder, a 37-foot inflated raft is dubbed Piraruku, after the area's giant fish. The raft will carry them through the maze of waters that lead to the Amazon. The adventure ahead will be interrupted frequently as the men pause to explore vast territories beyond the banks. The raft carries passengers from two separate worlds, a satellite transmitter and an Ashanaka Indian, Polycarpo. 
His people gather silently to watch Jean-Michel Cousteau lead the floating Conestoga wagon by. Policarpo is renowned for his innate sense of currents. He reads the river, Dominique Soumian steers. The Indians' decisions must be instant and instinctive. Whirling rapids and heavy sediments continually reshape the river. Maps are instantly out of date. Policarpo sounds incessantly. Shallows loom up everywhere. Still, the inevitable occurs. Like many rafts built for rapids, the Pirarucu cannot function in reverse. The men must repeatedly push their wagon train back on the trail. On the Ucayali River, water's slow. Even in the dry season, short squalls herald the trademark of the nearing Amazon, rain. Life grows calm. Electronician Guy Juas attends to laundry, Dominique to his beard. The heat and insects of the Ucayali, known as Mosquito River, are relieved by a rainforest singular bath, water from the roof. Everyone on the crowded raft, cameramen, scientists, expedition leader, pitches in. Jean-Michel cooks dinner. Policarpo, Pepe, the raft's mascot, and the team share food, drink, and camaraderie during the few days without jungle expeditions. The frontier craft nears a frontier town, Pucalpa. Liaison between the Peruvian interior and the Pacific coast. Here, trucks converge, transferring goods to barges that will forge into the jungle. Trees from the forest are turned to lumber. So dust and other detritus of civilization are shoved into the water. Important aids to the ecosystem, hungry vultures consume wastes. Continuing down the headwaters, Jean-Michel contacts Cousteau, sailing up the Amazon toward their rendezvous. The flood crest, which passed headwaters, still submerges the Amazon forest. A hovercraft team investigates this year's unusually high waters. Settlers are accustomed to inundation each and every year. Their lives are thrown off balance, not by the return of the flood, only by the unpredictability of its depths. This year's catastrophe is already met with fatalistic calm. A flooded hut collapsed. Two homeless families crowd an abandoned riverboat. One father can't say how many children crammed the boat, though 15 hens died. He's rebuilt before, he'll do it again. With a taste for beef introduced by Europeans, settlers struggle to raise cattle poorly suited to the region. Cowhands astride canoes bring the pastures to their cattle. High floods cause high fatalities among animals. The flood's changing levels permit only primitive farming, day-to-day -day existence. Settlers take the situation or leave it. They depart for poor soils on high ground 
or accept uncertainty, instability, subsistence. Fishing is also meager in the flood when aquatic animals disperse to the forest to feed. Only those who can maneuver canoes in jungle and have sure hands with harpoons or bows succeed. Arrows are shot nearly parallel to the surface on the chance that they will pierce fish as they skip repeatedly through water. When fish are actually spotted in sunken roots, the experienced always hit target. The exacting art is possible only on rainless days, when keen eyes can see leaves tremble as fish feed. Like Hemingway's hero, alone in his skiff, an old man waits for the rare trophy, a piraruku. Weighing as much as 300 pounds, the giant often grazes the same waters. Fishermen who glimpse the creature one afternoon return the next to wait and hope. The fish breathes with a primitive lung and gills. The old man watches to see its surface for air. He hurls his harpoon instantly. <laughs> the animal's only enemies are jaguars and fishermen, who rarely understand laws to protect the disappearing creature. The powerful fish may struggle two hours before it can be given the death-delivering blows. To fishermen, winning a piraruku equals the kill of a lion to Maasai warriors. Its flesh is dried for food, its scales hardened to sand wood, Bones will be cautiously disposed. Settlers believe that sorcerers can use them to curse the man who caught and killed the fish. The exploration of the Amazon marks Cousteau's 53rd expedition. In all his voyages, his home came with him, Calypso. After all their encounters with nature's strange phenomena, the men eagerly awaited touch of the familiar male. Alors, Dick Murphy. Dick Murphy. Hop. Great. Très Merci. Mounier. Colin. Scott. Là. Mounier. Mounier. Falco. Merci. Silvio. Oh. Good. Oh. Catcher is an integral team member with free access to the ship's most sensitive equipment room. The animal casually strolls the echo sounder and side scan sonar, while electronician Michel Trebos communicates with Cousteau's bureaus in Los Angeles, Norfolk, New York, Paris, and Monaco. Telex and satellite systems enable Cousteau to organize a far-flung mission more complicated than any he has undertaken.
team cooperation is not only amiable, but essential. Madame Cousteau herself, rarely filmed, serves as supply officer, nurse, sonar operator, hairstylist. Once asked how many sons she had, she gave the number of crew members. She now has 26, plus Otter. There is time, of course, to ponder the Amazons and parallel life. Both pink and gray dolphins abound in these waters. River people refuse to harm the two unusual species, fearing they are phantoms who live below, transforming to dolphins as they near the surface. Cousteau visits a farm caretaker who says a dolphin appeared as a girl while he was cooking lunch. Cousteau asks if she was beautiful. So exquisite that she captivated him despite his age. She wore only lingerie bottoms and a bra. Transfixing me with her eyes, he said, she wanted to bewitch me and take me away. He hadn't been afraid, just worried about his burning lunch. He knew she was a dolphin, but he was tempted to follow the beautiful creature. If she returns, he'll follow. Maybe in his old age, his luck has come. <laughs> Ask him what he thinks about the Brazilian uh, story that uh, when young uh, chicas become pregnant, they claim it is a dolphin. Does he believe in that? Cousteau has been told that dolphins were once noted as fathers on birth certificates. True, but the baby is a horrendous, deformed fish. And does this, uh, is this also true in Peru? Yes. Of course, he said. It happened to my mother. A los cuatro meses que mi mamá estaba en estado, ya caí el fete, pero... So awful were her pregnancy pains, they called a medicine man, who gave her herbs. Y llamamos un médico que comprendía de esa, de esa, de esa cuestión. Le convidó no sé qué cosas ahí de vegetales y vino el fete. When the fetus aborted, it was fish-shaped. Ay, me la chapo el médico. Un pese así. A gray dolphin. Little known to scientists, the Amazon's gray dolphin has never been studied in the wild. For a scientist from INPA, Brazil's Institute for Amazon Research, Cousteau's men spot the animal. They lay a huge net to enclose the creature in a bay. The nimble dolphin confirms its reputation for speed and agility to the ship's doctor. Albert Falco, Cousteau's most trusted observer of marine animals, quickly directs the dolphin's transfer to a makeshift pool fenced off in the bay. The animal, outstretched on foam, is splashed so that its sensitive skin will not dry during the short trip. Xavier Despier carries the animal to the pool.
Bon, ben on va y aller, hein. The world's smallest dolphins, often only five feet long, the greys swim in rapidly moving groups and seem dependent on attachments to others in their school. They are known to Brazilians as the sacred dolphins. Scientist Vera da Silva times the dolphins' breaths. The grey dolphin is said to swim a swift and purposeful course. To the men's surprise, the animals spontaneously leap with lyrical grace. Xavier and cameraman Louis Preslin cannot repress an impulse to applaud. Noted for their well-developed dorsal fin without the bulging head of the unusual pink dolphin famous in these waters, the streamlined creatures more closely resemble classic ocean dolphins. Cousteau discusses the differences between species with De Silva, who specializes in freshwater dolphins. The pink, says De Silva, is the more primitive species. Cousteau is most struck by the pink dolphin's great appliancy its awesome ability actually to fold its body in two. Its widely spaced vertebrae give it extreme suppleness. Cousteau recalls the first time he heard the pink dolphin's loud blow. A dolphin in the treetops. Fast but not flexible, greys stay in deep water, avoiding the tortuous paths between vines in the flooded forest. Their documentation complete, Cousteau and De Silva free the dolphin. Panicked river folk tell of men driven to madness, even exhausted to death, by dervish passions of dolphin girls. Our team is seduced by the dolphin in its own form. A jet from Paris pierces the dawn. After attending to the expedition details in Europe, Jacques Cousteau returns to Brazil. Fishermen have told him that now is the best season to film the Amazon's exceptional pink dolphin. Cousteau immediately transfers to his amphibious plane. He will fly directly to Priya Grande on the Rio Negro, where fishermen say they often find pink dolphins. Since I first saw the countless creatures from my ship, I have been bewitched. The most primitive of living tooth cetaceans, the eerie pastel animals may be early models of dolphins that today play in the sea. The aberrations below contort like rubber. They turn their heads at 90 degree angles, even rotate in their loose skins. His javelin beak 
charging ahead, one dolphin follows a fish as though chasing a shadow. On the Rio Negro tributary, fishermen come to a favorite spot, never changing areas, passing the niche from father to son. One employer hires workers to heave huge circular nets to catch migrating fish. Pink Amazon dolphins, hungry for the same windfall, become entangled. Because Brazil's research institute sends scientists here, the men help out by pulling the animals ashore for study. Da Silva represents the institute, Two dolphins have been caught. The impish animals are far from timid, known to sneak under canoes to steal settlers' paddles. Scientists confirm the tale of one fisherman who calls a pink dolphin to aid him. The animal chases fish into his net for an hour at a time. The captured dolphins are moved for tagging. The fishermen are cautious. Bad luck or even disease curse those responsible for dolphin deaths. After tagging, the fishermen will return the dolphins to freedom. Once believed blind, their sight is functional. The animals hear exceptionally well and are especially capable of targeting splashing fish by sound in the Amazon's murky waters. Their beaks, studded with sensitive hairs, probe the floor for hidden creatures. It is pointless to pen the animals, settlers say. They simply sprout legs and walk away. <laughs> Did he have uh, trouble? Maybe he could tell a story now, I think. The owner of the fishing operation is well versed in the pink dolphin's spectral powers. One day, when he was about 34 and working here, a dolphin appeared. At the time, his wife was five months pregnant. The dolphin's gaze met his. The animal came close, but jumped away when the men pulled in their nets. The dolphin was caught, tied, turned on his back. The owner beat the animal. The creature leaped to liberty. The next day, they found the dolphin dead. Time passed, his wife gave birth. The baby girl had a dolphin's head, except for the rostrum. But there were two blowholes. In, in uh, several places in Peru and here, uh, some fishermen were telling me that uh, it is a grey dolphin that sometimes takes the shape of a human being mm. to go dancing with girls. Here it is the pink, not the little grey that turns into humans. Cousteau is also told dolphin men are identifiable. At dances, they wear hats. 
for cashier the, the blowholes to hide the blowholes. Mm -hmm. They keep the hat on their head to uh, that's, hide that's the right, blowholes. Right. So maybe you are a dolphin. Yeah. Maybe you are a camello. <laughs> One fisherman I met told me that even sometimes uh, at night one of the dolphins would transform in beautiful girl, Chica Preciosa, they said in uh, in the old... Você já ouviu essa? Não, não, já, 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 não, antigamente agora não dou certo só para cá. It used to happen at fiestas, but no more. The young generation no longer believes, so the dolphins no longer transform. The old beliefs are still expressed in a folk song. A dolphin stole a sweetheart away. Lunch on Calypso is lively. The previous night, a jaguar shinnied up the anchor chain, climbed aboard, and was dispatched with a broom. Catcher joins his crew. Indians are said to take otters as pets. But Catcher, with his good-natured self-assurance, is more than a pet. He is a shipboard personality. Disdaining the discussion of his only predator, the jaguar, Catcher parts to dine upon his own daily eight pounds of fish. Life all along the river is congenial in high waters. Men gather at Calypso's rails to glimpse the stately majesty of the Amazonia. Grand freighter of the Valdez line, she proudly glides upriver. But waters that rise slowly throughout the year abruptly drop in August. Weeks before on water, the MS Amazonia now sails a prairie. For some, receding waters mean profusion, fertile soils, and a river enriched by drained jungle foliage. But elsewhere, life is buffeted by the change. Hordes of fish strand and die. Birds build nests on ships' bare bottoms. Survivors adapt to the alien, made all the more precarious by nature's whims. Depending on rain, the river can drop as little as 18 feet, as much as 45. Settlers, wildlife, even regal ship lines are entangled together 
in her web of unpredictability. Calypso proceeds upriver a few miles from her planned meeting with the source team. In the flood, the ship was endangered by salvos of uprooted trees that shot along the surface. Now the threat looms a yard below her keel, the bottom. Propellers are stopped. Cousteau asks that the engines be slowly re-engaged. Bottom measurements don't improve. Anchor is dropped. Warrior. Cousteau has made his decision. Calypso will proceed no farther. Along the expedition, Calypso's shallow draft riverboat has sailed waters Calypso could not. Now she is needed at home. On the headwaters, Jean-Michel's raft team has nearly completed its descent from the Amazon source. Tomorrow they will meet the ship. This assignment will be finished. <laughs> Pepe the parrot will leave about Calypso. The man will be reorganized, the raft dismantled. The headwater adventure is recalled, future adventures anticipated. The champagne seems somehow bittersweet. The important day has dawned. Combined efforts of raft and ship to follow the Amazon source to mouth are about to reach their finale. Cousteau radios his son on the Ucayale headwaters. He tells Jean-Michel that the ship stopped slightly short of its planned route because of dropping water levels. She is anchored at the confluence of the Ucayale tributary and the Marañón. She will strand if she goes farther. Alors, où êtes-vous exactement? Donne-moi ta position à l'heure actuelle. Nous sommes dans le Yucayali. The raft, says Jean-Michel, is only five miles away. It will cross the final waters to Calypso. Le début de la rivière Amazon. Bon, ben écoute, je vais vous envoyer mes annexes. Cousteau will send escorts to welcome the raft on its last triumphant miles. Okay. The equipment Cousteau jokingly calls Calypso's annexes, hovercraft, riverboat, helicopter, have greatly expanded the expedition's range. They now will see the mission to its end. Joas dons formal attire after five months on freezing and tropic tributaries, sardined with as many as 13 crew and scientists. Like a migrating bird finally heading home, the raft joins the covey of equipment speeding toward Calypso. The raft team has traveled 1,700 miles from the mountain where the Amazon is born in icy drops of glacial waters. Calypso has journeyed 2,300 miles upriver from the Atlantic. Together, they have covered the Amazon's entire course. Simone Cousteau, known as La Bergère, the shepherdess to her men, comes to the foredeck to see her crew reunite.
Frozen provisions in the Andes, swollen legs and ulcerated arms from insect bites, debilitating intestinal problems from jungle parasites, all are anecdotes of the past. The grand achievement predominates the present. More than 1,000 samples are being flown to international labs. Shipboard computers store data on microscopic river life. Electronic probes have analyzed water quality along Calypso's entire path. We have used equipment never imagined by conquistadors who starved and died of fever who were attacked by no mythic Amazon women warriors, so no lost continent. But we entered the jungle nearly as dense, untamed, unpenetrated as the one Pizarro discovered 400 years ago. And we leave it, obsessed with the same spellbound sense of wonder. The time has come to say goodbye to Catcher. Jean-Michel, Falco and Cousteau will dive with the otter that so often swam with them in liberty and always came back home. Catcher's friends gather to bid adieu. Like all his species, Katja dives and surfaces without apparent movement of muscle, without sound, even without a ripple. He's as fluid as the river. None of the men wants to part with Katja. But keeping him would be a mistake. A freshwater animal, he could not survive the saltwater seas and changing climates of Calypso's future journeys. Nor can they set him free. Accustomed to humans, he would be shot and skinned immediately. A Brazilian scientist who lives on an artificial lake preserve says Catcher can safely roam free there with him. The animal's stiff-legged shuffle marks his territory. Releasing a strong, musky scent from two anal glands, Catcher leaves information about his sex and receptivity for otters he will sadly never see. The scientist has arrived to take Katja. We are sure of our decision for the animal's safety. We looked endlessly for a companion for him. None existed. Animal dealers could only offer hides. The men say farewell to Katja, and maybe to his species. The otter's precarious situation reflects that of the forest in which he lives. The Amazon's astonishing variety of life is intertwined in ways we do not yet understand. What happens when we remove a Katja what happens if the younger generations who no longer believe in legends, no longer refrain from hunting dolphins or protecting the mighty Amazon itself? Older settlers say that spirits steal the souls of those who abuse the living world. Perhaps it is true. 
We humans also fit into nature's one great vibrant whole. When we lose a catcher or an Amazon, we lose a part of ourselves. The Amazon rainforest is the world's largest living laboratory. Under its canopy, unknown wonders await discovery. New medicines, fibers, foods, the thriving kingdom flourishes on a tight, efficient system. Fallen leaves break down quickly in the warmth and wet. Roots at the ground's surface recycle nutrients immediately. In the Amazon's poor soils, the forest feeds itself. Cousteau team ventures into the jungle's interior. They will learn what happens when this life cycle is broken, when trees are stripped away for a few years farming, when no seeds remain to renew the forest, no animals to disperse them, when without foliage, rain patterns change even around the globe. Half the world's rainforests are gone now. Some experts warn the Amazons may disappear in some 50 years. Ever since humans turned Mesopotamia's ancient gardens into a Sahara, a philosopher's wisdom has been repeatedly confirmed. Forests precede peoples and nations, he wrote. Deserts succeed them. The Amazon has long ruled humans. Now humans attempt to shackle the Amazon to build dams and detour tributaries. In the past, such massive undertakings, engineered with pride, not foresight, impatience, not wisdom, crippled the Nile and other great waterways on Earth. They are rivers of the past. The Amazon is the river of the future. Which will it become? Proof of hopeless folly or testament to our hard-won wisdom. <laughs>